Alrighty. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Nicole and I'm a marketing manager here at Smart Bear for the Swagger team. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how to migrate over to OAS3 from your existing APIs. So today we're going to be talking with Keshav and Steven about uh, what's new in OAS 3.0 and the tools that you can use with Swagger to uh, convert on over. So without further ado, Keshav, take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nicole. As uh, Nicole introduced me, I'm Keshav. I do product marketing for all things Swagger within this company. And uh, today we're just going to be understanding more about, you know, what is the Open API? What is the latest, uh, the version Open API 3.0? What does it bring to the table in terms of features? And uh, how do you actually take an existing API, be it uh, say you have an existing 2.0 definition, which you want to convert to 3.0, or if you have an existing API, who with, with no definition, how do you create uh, an, an API OAS 3.0 definition from that specific implementation? So we're gonna be covering a lot of those cases and uh, most of this will be a demo which we will show eventually. So I wanna, wanna kick things off by actually talking about how, you know, when you, in the past, how APIs have been developed, right? Like well, APIs have been around for like a long time, even actually before the advent of the PC. Uh, and uh, while APIs have been around, then you know they've always been confined to the back end of your applications. But it's only and you know traditionally when you build APIs, you think of just you know you have an idea for like why you need to build an API, and usually it was because you wanted to maybe speed up a process internally. You wanted to connect two applications together, and essentially you. you wanted to deliver uh, features faster, right? And so you you had this idea, you'd quickly build out this API and make sure it works, you know, because it's connecting two different applications. And finally, you would go about, go in and like deploy that API. Uh, and APIs were never thought of more than just connectors, right? They were just like saying, hey, let's just get this done and like move on with it. No one actually gave APIs a second thought. And questions like, what is the business objective of this API? Is this API going to be consumable? Is this API even going to be sustainable? Meaning, will we be uh, maintaining this API over a period of time? Those questions were never really answered because, again, APIs are always confined to the back end of your applications. But this is changing, right? This is changing because we're in an economy where APIs are actually driving business and strategic goals. As you know, by 2020, uh, every person is going to be having more than seven devices per person. That's a lot of communication between different devices and a lot of APIs working to make sure these these applications stay afloat and work. And so that just means that APIs are now mission critical. And so you need to be thinking of APIs as not just like, you know, things that are nice to have, but actually driving your product portfolio forward. And while this approach which I showed on your screen makes sense, if you want to just build out an API, there are a couple of problems you'll face. One is it becomes extremely hard to maintain documentation, tests, and implementation, right? Your APIs are always bound to change. That is the nature of any product, and your APIs are no different. They will always be subject to change. And as your teams grow, as you have more and more software developers and testers and DevOps people joining your team, uh, your business logic and your business function for your API is going to change. And things that get affected by the business logic, like you know your QA uh, uh, strategy or your documentation team, they are all going to be impacted directly and it becomes hard to keep all of them in sync. The second is, you know, in the past, you know, when in the traditional API development, you never thought of consumer experience and sustainability. It was always an afterthought. The, the primary goal was to just get that API out there quickly as, po as quickly as possible. And that implementation of the API always came at the cost of the user experience because, again, there was no forcing function for you to think about the end consumer. And finally, uh, as you're building out more and more services, the goal of that of the goal of having an API strategy is really to make sure that you know the there's interoperability and uh, reusability of uh, different data across different services, right? And uh, you shouldn't be imposing any sort of restrictions uh, on this uh, reuse of data. Meaning, if say someone made a service had built a service in PHP and the other person has a Java implemented service, there shouldn't be any restriction which said, "Oh, you only need to have say a PHP uh, an SDK in this specific language to use my to, to consume my service." Right. So it, you need to make sure that communication between services was easy, which is why a common vocabulary is so important. You, a common vocabulary or like a common framework for your APIs that not doesn't just keep all of your internal stakeholders in sync, meaning from your, arch, your architectural team, your technical writing team, your QA and your development team, all of them know what this API does and they also know what this API, what their job functions are with respect to this API. 
but also it actually takes care of the consumability aspect of your API right? and make sure that, you know, there's that the consumer knows exactly what this API is supposed to do, that they actually have a great experience working with your API. And this consumer isn't just a human, right? It's not just any person like reading your API documentation. It could also be an application that consumes your service because again, you want your service to be machine consumable because applications want, as we're getting into the era of automation, applications need to be able to consume a service, which is why the open API specification became the standard and uh, restful industry for defining APIs. So think of the open API as just a simple framework that's human and machine readable, that's easy to use, and essentially defines what your API does. So all it does, it tells you what are the different resources your API exposes, and what are the different uh, requests and response cycles associated with each of those resources. That's fundamentally what it does, that's it. Right? And there's no code behind, there's no code involved in this. All it's, it's, it's just purely a definition framework. Uh, and the cool thing is because it's, it's one is it's language agnostic. So you could have your services built in Node.js. The other person could have their services built in Ruby. There's no restriction whatsoever. Your API is, if you have an API that's in the restful world, you can uh, define that using the open API specification. And also it's also, it's human and machine readable. So not, it's easy to use by humans and machines can actually like software applications can parse that definition and they can you know pump that into whatever automation workflow you want. So it's, it's, it's really, really cool. And it's super simple to use, as I mentioned. This, for example, is, an exa this, for example, is uh, the Open API 2.0 version. And, and if you notice, like all it is at the foundation of it is just purely defining the requests and responses associated with every API. So you have, for example, your metadata associated with that API, uh, which is the high level overview of what your API does. You have your resources, over here, for example, we have the pets resource. Uh, and we, finally, we have the requests and the responses that we detail under the specific resource. So it's super simple in terms of like usability and readability of this API. So if open API is the specification format, which allows you to define what your API does, then what is Swagger? Well, think of Swagger as this ecosystem of tooling uh, that allows you to implement your API, your open API specification in different aspects of your life cycle. So, you know, your definition format at the end of the day can, will only be confined as a definition. And unless it has real implications in your life cycle, you, there's, there's no real value. And which is why Swagger working with open API can bring real value into your life cycle. So we have tools like uh, the Swagger editor for defining your API. We have a uh, the Swagger UI for documenting your API. We have tools like Swagger Inspector for testing APIs and Swagger Hub for collaborating on API development as a team, right? So essentially all of this is are like different aspects of your life cycle. And uh, Swagger is one of the world's most popular API lifecycle tooling, which consists of both open source and commercial tools, like a mix of uh, some of the Swagger open source tools are downloaded uh, 10 million times so far. And so it's a big community, a uh, very supportive, open and transparent community. Uh, and we've, and you know, feel free to like hit us up on GitHub anytime. So I mentioned open API. So one of the things I did, I do want to mention is that open API is right now in its, in its current state, it's version 3.0. Uh, and so it does bring some unique capabilities into the forefront. Um, so if you think about what's new in open API, right, I, the way I've segmented this is into two categories. One are like some basic, uh, not, I, I wouldn't say basic, but they're more like, you know, uh, good capabilities that, you know, that doesn't need to, uh, that we don't need to like dwell too much into. Uh, and we can, and this, the, the time we have in front of us is enough to cover them. And there are some advanced features that probably not fit the, the time constraint we have for this webinar. So uh, some, imp uh, some basic features include, you know, improved reusability, changes in parameters and examples, and some content negotiation support. Uh, but Open API 3.0 does have some, some pretty awesome uh, capabilities like enhanced security definition. So you have more use cases for that. Uh, callbacks and links as well. So that's also something which has been very well received by the community. So those are some of the advanced uh, features. In this webinar, we will be showing more of the basic functionalities. Um, just a quick overview of like some of the changes that have been made under the basic category. One is, you know, there's been a structural change, right? So it's one, if you notice on the left was Open API 2.0. Uh, and Open API 2.0 has, if you'd see, like, you know, it has a lot of uh, ca uh, co components that go into the root of that API uh, API structure. 
right? So you have all of your hosts and base path and your schemes, which are, you know, like server information right under the, under the root of the definition. You have uh, your reusable components, which are defined by uh, the definition, the parameters and the responses, meaning, you know, these are the things that can be reused across your API. That's all again on the root. And, you know, there's like, from a structural perspective, uh, these definitions can be hard to read. Uh, and as your definitions and your resources get larger and you know, as, your, as your strategy scales, it becomes harder to read and consume this API definition. So Open API 3.0 actually makes it much easier to read and write these definitions by actually compartmentalizing uh, different parts of your definition into like much easier to grasp uh, sections, right? So all your server information is actually categorized under the server object. The security definition, there's like a separate instance just for security under which goes like, you know, reusable security definitions and also like the actual description of that security object. And uh, same goes for your resources and all the reusable components now have been compartmentalized into something called components. So in the past we had definitions, parameters and responses. All of them were three separate objects under the root of the file. Uh, components over here are just like bring all of them into together so that it's much easier to read and understand. The second is parameters. Again, like the, you know, these are just examples of some of the parameters that have been around. Uh, the, a new uh, feature are the cookie parameters. So you can now actually send cookie requests in your uh, parameters for making that API call. So that's actually pretty cool. Um, there's also like the, before like there was the body uh, parameter in Swagger 2.0, that's actually been removed and we actually have something called request body. So request body actually allows you to, you know, change it, it takes, it's the replacement for that. And it's actually much easier to write and also brings in some uh, descriptive capabilities. Like you can actually define them better. Um, and of course there's like further serialization support as well. And finally, we have a uh, constant negotiation. So, you know, it, Open API 3.0 allows your API to support some form of media type uh, negotiation between clients and servers. Uh, there was basic support in Swagger 2.0 with the consumes and produces object in the past. Uh, that's been actually removed and uh, you can now actually uh, define different media types in your responses and request body schemas. Um, as you can see on the screen, like application JSON, you can define the schema. And then if you put ac application XML, you can also define the schema. And depending on the request, you will get different media types. So that's also a pretty cool uh, uh, feature that's been added. Uh, we did actually do a, an old webinar on uh, how to actually define your open API 3.0 API, uh, definitions. Uh, that's on YouTube. It's available for free on demand. Again, uh, just if you go to YouTube and search for how to design APIs in open API 3.0, uh, we've done a past webinar that's been, uh, that's got some good feedback. So that could also be useful. So, Let's actually dive into creating uh, Open API 3.0. So there's really two approaches to how you develop your APIs. If you think about it, one is once you plan your API, you actually design the API first, meaning you force yourself to define what this API does for you. Once you define your API, uh, you can develop, document, and test your API simultaneously because again, your definition is the contract uh, that aligns all of these different stakeholders together. Right. And finally, you can go in and deploy your API. This has been called a definition driven development approach. Right? And it's, it's relatively newer in the REST API ecosystem because, again, you you have the definition as the center of your entire API development and deployment strategy. Uh, however, like the a bigger chunk of the market still has this problem of actually having a lot of existing APIs that they want to generate the definitions for. Or in many cases, you know, there will be instances where you have to just develop and get the API out there. And you probably won't have time to like go through an entire design uh, phase where you design what this API does before you go about implementing it. Right. And, and in this case, it would probably start with like you plan the API, out, you develop the API, you test the API. And then you actually generate the definition from your existing API implementation. You document it and finally deploy that API, right? And in this case, the big question is how do you actually generate the open API definition file, which you know has so many different advantages and you know, helps you standardize your development. How do you get that from an existing API implementation, right? Or sometimes, you know, you might, there's also the other case where you have an existing um, open API 2.0 file. And as, as we mentioned, 3.0 is the latest version. How do you get the 3.0 file from this existing API uh, definition file? 
right? So those are some of the questions we want to address in today's uh, webinar and demo. That's, that'll be coming up soon. But just a quick overview of the code first approach, as I mentioned, and this is where, you know, your API is directly implemented. Uh, and only from here, from the implementation is where the open API file is generated. And uh, the advantage is, is that, you know, this is faster to get the API out into the market. And it's perfect for internal APIs if you think that, you know, there's no not a lot of consumers and the people who consume that API can actually understand this API without going through a full-fledged design uh, function. So the best way to like explain these concepts which we just detailed and like also the solutions associated with them is to actually do uh, a demo, right? And in, um, and in this demo, you know, we wanna take a hypothetical real world scenario based on some of our conversations with existing clients. And uh, what we've come up, come up with is, you know, like let's, let's uh, have a role play or like a, uh, an imaginary scenario where we're part of the Swagger pet store company. And uh, we've been around for like a while, maybe like 20 years. And that means we have a mixture of legacy APIs and also like moving forward, we wanna modernize our API development as well. Uh, what the pet store does is from the name itself, it's like a, it's kind of like an online pet store where you can think of it as an Amazon for pet stores. So you can come in, you can search for uh, pets, uh, depending on, again, their availability. Sometimes, you know, you might have pets which are unavailable. Uh, so depending on their availability, you can search for pets uh, and then you can uh, purchase them through an e-commerce transaction, right? So, and we have, and this has been supported in the past by all these existing legacy APIs to keep that in place. But, you know, one of our the CTO has heard about the amazing things of OAS 3.0, the advantages it brings, and now they want to generate that open AP, that uh, the definition file for their existing API implementations. Uh, and the other um, and the other thing which uh, one of the product managers discovered was that uh, they already had a few Swagger or, or, or Open API 2.0 files, and they want to convert those 2.0 files to 3.0. So those are some of the two cases which you want to cover. And so from here, I'm going to be passing it off to Stephen, uh, who will actually be walking you through some of the workflows uh, that uh, might be something we'll be experiencing. Thanks, Keisha. So the first thing I want to talk about is the situation where you have an, an OAS2 specification created and how you can convert to OAS3. This is something that is easily done with a couple of clicks within our Swagger Hub platform. Now, Swagger Hub is an API design and documentation platform built for teams to create consistent API specifications and documentation. It allows you to have faster standardized design, confusion-free collaboration, and a catalog of all your APIs within your company that is centralized for anyone to view or consume. We also integrate with several different co uh, code repositories like Bitbucket and GitHub, some management uh, deployment platforms like AWS and Microsoft Azure, and some testing platforms like our product, Ready API. So let's go in to Swagger Hub now. And what we're gonna look at is our existing Swagger Pet Store specification. We can see in the top here, this is a Swagger 2.0. I'm not really gonna talk about Swagger Hub yet. I'm gonna leave that to my colleague Keshav to talk more about when we discuss uh, creating specs within here. So I have this 2.0 that I've uploaded into Swagger Hub. From here, I can just select our convert to AP, open API 3 option. And this conversion will occur in a matter of seconds. So now I can see that open API 3 is the type and new structures like this servers field has been added so now I can leverage a lot of the basic and advanced functionality that OAS3 has to offer. So if you have any existing Swagger 2 specs, it's a very simple process. You upload it to Swagger Hub, and then you, in a couple of clicks, you can convert it to 3.0. The next scenario that I wanna talk about is migrating your legacy API to the Open API 3 specification. The first option is utilizing Swagger Core, which is an annotation system for Java-based APIs. 
And from there, it will generate an OAS3 definition. We will then utilize the Swagger Maven, Swagger Hub Maven plugin to take that definition and upload it into Swagger Hub in an automated fashion. So now we can even think about building this workflow into any existing CI CD systems that we have in our company. And then from there, we can utilize Swagger Hub and all of, all of its features for documentation and uh, further API development. The second option is Swagger Inspector. With Inspector, we will ping the existing pet store API, generate a definition from that inspected endpoint, and then deploy it into Swagger Hub in, in, a, in a matter of seconds. And again, from there, Keshev will show how we can leverage OAS3 with our Swagger Hub platform. All right. So let's talk about Swagger Core first at a very high level. It's an open source Swagger tool that exists for Java APIs. It's a, it's a Java-based implementation of Swagger. The most current version, uh, 2.0, supports generating for open API three definitions. And you guys can check it out on GitHub. Some of the annotations that you can utilize for Java-based APIs include things like a get or post annotation to define what HTTP method. You can define resource paths, accepted media types, parameters, and things like the description and API responses with the operations tag. Now, when you start digging into what OAS3 is and this Swagger core tool, you'll see that a lot of the terminology is kept the same throughout so that when you're a developer, you're thinking about adding this tooling to your development, it becomes a less frustrating process when the terminology is, is the same across the board. So let's go ahead and open up our code base here. And what I'm gonna show you is just a small example of a pet object and how we translate that into a resource path. This code base is available on GitHub for anyone to check out. So I recommend looking at it, looking how we implement all the different parts of the pet store within our Swagger core tooling. It's just a neat way to get your hands dirty in terms of the Swagger tooling. So first thing we have is our pet.java class. This is where I just define what a pet is, what kind of information is stored within this pet object. I'm not gonna to dive too deep into the Java of this code, but that's what it does at a high level. I then have my pet data class where I'm defining a list of pets and categories and even filling in some dummy information so that when I stand up this API and actually make the calls, it will actually give you some information back so I can start interacting with it within my browser. And now when we think about Let's add the Swagger uh, tooling, the, the Swagger core tooling into this Java API. In the example I'm gonna show you, I have this get method with a path parameter for slash pet ID. I have my operations tag, which will define things like the description and several different responses that are available within this path. And if we look at the first API response, we can see that the pet.class implementation is pulled in to the schema for that API response. And then a little further down, we can see the get pet ID method that will actually describe some of the parameters and do the actual business logic to pull out the proper pet depending on the ID that I give. So that's a quick look at this sample Java code base. And when I open my browser up, I can actually start pinging this API since it is standing up on my local machine. So I ping slash pet slash one. I can see some information given to me. I can, you know, go to three. I think that has information there. And then if I give some number that doesn't exist, I'll see this pet not found. So this is an existing API that is currently there. And because I implemented Swagger Core within this code base, 
I have now been able to generate a full open API three specification from those annotations. So Swagger Core will actually look through my whole code base and generate this in a URL format for me to consume. And if I just scroll down here, I can see the different operations and that pet ID method that we were talking about is now represented here. I can see the get method. I can see things like the tags, the parameters. I'll scroll down a little further here and we can have a look at the available responses. All of these were defined within my, my code base that I then annotated with Swagger Core and is now brought to me in a human and machine readable format, which is one of the benefits of OAS3. All right. So this is a great first step into our automated workflow. But as I said before, we have a Maven plugin that will actually push into Swagger Hub for this example. We can also, for this example, we'll be pushing onto Swagger Hub, but we can also pull API definitions from Swagger Hub. So when you're thinking about how to build this into your workflow, you have a couple of options here to pull and push. And then here's an example of the Swagger Maven plugin implemented in a Palm file. And I'll talk more about that with my example. Some of the parameters that are available with this uh, plugin are things like indicating the API name, what account is gonna own the API, what file it is. We can also, we also need a token, which is given to us by Swagger Hub. This is a token to make sure that whoever's trying to push an API into a certain account actually has the access rights to do so. And I'll show you briefly how to get that token. It's a very quick process. And one thing I wanna note is that Swagger Hub does have an on-premises version. And that version is supported with this Swagger Hub Maven plugin because you can list different host protocols and ports of your API. So you, you have that flexibility as well with the Swagger Hub on-premises. All right. Now I wanna show you guys how to just get the API key. I'm signed in in my user account. I'll go to my settings and under API keys, I can copy the API key for my account. So now anything that is under my account, I can now push and pull from. And in my Maven framework, I will implement the uh, Swagger Maven plugin. So I have here this plugin. It will execute as part of the deploy phase. If you're not familiar with the Maven framework, I recommend this is something you look into a little more, but these phases are just different states of your uh, SDLC, uh, of your API or your software development cycle. And currently it's just gonna deploy, the goal being uploading. I give my API a name, a Maven Deployed Pet Store API. I indicate the owner. I have my token imported here. And I have the format set to JSON. So now I have this set up. I run the installation, which I've done previously. And within my command line to complete this process, I will just run the Maven deploy command. It'll kick off, it'll take a couple of seconds, but we can see that now that I'm building out this automated framework, I can easily inject it into something like um, Jenkins or Bamboo in a more automated fashion. So now we can see it's uploading to Swagger Hub with the parameters and the build was considered successful. So let's go ahead in Swagger Hub and actually see that API. So I'll go here, I'll refresh this. Now we see this Maven deployed pet store API. And if we have a look in it, we can see that the API is successfully installed where I have all of the functionality of Swagger Hub now to either make changes or utilize the UI for just documentation, all within a couple of steps very easily. 
So that's the Swagger Core Maven plugin workflow when, you, when it comes to importing your legacy APIs into Swagger Hub. The next thing I wanna show you, our second option for this tooling is Swagger Inspector. It's an easy to use online tool that we released this year. It's cloud-based and free. You can perform simple tests and validations against your API calls. And it has a very easy functionality for open API two and three generation. So you can ensure that your APIs work as intended. You can explore your API if it's not well documented and then even create documentation from that exploration. So let's go ahead and have a look at the tooling since it's all great to talk about, but it's even better to show. Now, to orient you at the screen we're looking at currently, in the top, I have my place where I can define the HTTP endpoint and the method that I want to use. I can set up my request parameters, authentication and headers, or body if it's a post method. Once I make this call, I can see that in the response field, the actual content. And as we're exploring, if this is a huge API, Swagger Inspector will collect the history of my calls, and I can actually build out a definition with multiple endpoints. Currently, I'm only gonna use one, but I just wanna make sure it's known that that is an option. And then to log in, I'll utilize my same credentials as Swagger Hub. I will grab my endpoint for a get call to my pet store API. We can see I'm just doing a call where I find pets by status, that status being available. And this query parameter is automatically translated to this field here. Now I will go ahead, hit send. I can see in real time the response. I can see the different IDs, the tags, all with the status available. So now I'm exploring my API. I look at the response and I say, okay, that's what I'm expecting. It's responding correctly. I understand a little bit more about this, but let's actually start documenting so that other people can understand this and not always have to make the API calls themselves. So I'll go ahead and in my history, I'll select that endpoint that I just made. Now, as I said, with Swagger Inspector, you can generate in OAS two or three, both options are available. And one thing there is to note is, is if you have an existing API that uses only Swagger two, you can use Inspector to read that specification and convert it to 3.0 as well. Currently, I'm just going to select the OAS3 specification option, create API definition. And since I'm logged in with my Swagger Hub credentials, I'll be brought directly into Swagger Hub where now I can see the API specification. So I'll give it a proper name here, add my versioning, and I'll import this open API. So now we can see here the different aspects, you know, it's, it's a 3.0. We have some auto-generated fields. We have some auto-generated descriptions, but the actual requests and responses are translated into the specification. And what Keshav is gonna show you uh, in a couple of minutes is how you can build upon this within Swagger Hub. But before we do that, let's, let's discuss the two workflows and the different pros and cons of each so that we can so that we can understand what what the benefits are before i do that actually let me add keshav here since i don't want him logging into my own account he has his own account here so with swagger hub i just click on his account i'll hit save and once we switch over to his machine he'll be able to show you what's going on make some changes which is all gonna be very good stuff. So the pros and cons of Swagger Core Maven plugin and Swagger Inspector. 
these are two very different workflows that can suit two very different processes depending on what your company is doing. So for Swagger Core, you can explicitly define your OAS3 spec to match the API exactly. It can also be easily automated with CI/CD systems since it's already leveraging a framework like Maven. Some of the cons are that it's only available in the Java language. So you have to commit to that language itself. And you also need knowledge of Java and the Maven framework. So if you're not already familiar, that can be a little bit more of a learning curve to get started with this tooling. Now Inspector, it can be utilized for all APIs despite the code base language. It'll just make the calls to the API. It doesn't matter what the backend is actually implemented in. You can generate specifications completely within a UI. And it, so it has very little learning curve. Some of the cons though are the generated service definitions may not be complete. I can make multiple calls to my pet, pet store API. And if I miss one or I miss a response, my service definition is not gonna have that represented. And currently there's no automated way to generate these specifications within Swagger Inspector. So as you can see, it, while it's pretty balanced, these are two very different workflows. So you have to evaluate what your company is currently doing to see what is best suited for your company, for your process in general. All right, so now that I've given Keshav access to my API, he's gonna go ahead and look at the API so that he can show you how you can edit things and leverage some of the cool OAS3 aspects from Swagger Hub. Yep, thank you so much for that great uh, walkthrough, uh, Stephen. I know we covered a lot in that uh, in that demo, but I hope it was really useful because I learned a lot, definitely. So uh, thank you so much, Stephen. So um, just to reiterate, like we covered two different uh, workflows there. One was if you had an existing 2.0 definition and you convert that to 3.0 on Swagger Hub uh, directly, or the other use case where, or, or, or in scenario where you have an existing uh, API implementation you, where you have an existing API implementation. Uh, just one second, uh, it looks like there's some audio trouble. Where you have some sort of existing API implementation in place and you actually use that implementation and uh, generate uh, the open API 3.0 file using either uh, Swagger Inspector, which is language agnostic, so you can use it for any different code base. Or if you're like a Maven and Java uh, aficionado, you can always uh, use uh, Swagger Core for doing that and automating it using the Swagger Hub Maven plugin. So now that we've generated the open API file, however, it's not the final definition. And the reason for that is, you know, we've mentioned about all the cool things open API does and foundationally it is a description format. And if you go to the, if, you, if, if you've seen the definition which uh, Stephen created from inspector, there's definitely room for improvement. There's definitely like places where you have to go in and, you know, add some more description so that it becomes easier to consume for your end consumers, for your internal stakeholders, and even for your applications that go in and parse those definitions. So if you're going to be doing exactly that on Swagger Hub. So Steven's actually, if you, uh, if you recall, Steven has actually added me as an individual contributor to the uh, open API definition file. And if you, and now you can see uh, my Swagger Hub instance. And uh, there's like, what you're seeing on the left is right now the navigation panel. And my, the My Hub section is highlighted, which shows all the APIs which I've created, you know, or which I've collaborated on. So for example, over here, uh, Cologne, org is uh, Steven's API and he's added me to that specific API. There's also APIs which I've personally created as well, which will be seen in, uh, let me just do a quick refresh. which will be seen in like, you know, uh, Cache 92 over here, which is my own personal APIs, which I've created. So this is essentially your personal workspace, right? Which you see APIs which you've collaborated on which you, or which you've created. On the left is also uh, for quick navigation, you can also uh, select, see the organizational APIs, which you're a part of. So Swagger Hub actually has the ability to create shared workspaces called organizations, where essentially you can add multiple people uh, um, 
segment them into teams and like essentially work together as a company or as a business or as, as a small team on your API development as well. And finally, Swagger Hub supports both private as well as public API documentation. So if you have a public API which you wanna share to the world, you can always use Swagger Hub because Swagger Hub will uh, abstract all of the hosting for you and we will do essentially all of the document, interactive documentation out of the box uh, on the platform. So let's actually go into Stephen's uh, API. And as soon as I click it, notice that it goes to the documentation, right? And this is essentially the definition file which uh, Stevens uh, created using Swagger Inspector. Now, uh, one of the things over here, if you notice, is uh, it there is like you know. Um, it's not the best definition because again, it's been created by looking at the traffic and one of uh, the jobs of a good developer and a documentation writer is to take what we have foundationally and using the best uh, uh, given the best uh, practices uh, from the open API, we can actually come in and define a great API. So let's actually start doing that. So let's actually go in and start giving some, uh, some uh, titles to this API. So, we know that this is a Swagger Pet Store API. So let's call this a Swagger. Uh, actually, before I do that, uh, I don't want to uh, affect Steven's main API because it's version one. So what I can actually do is I can actually add a new version to this API called version 2.0. Oops. My modify over there just in case. Um, 2.0 over there and I can create a new version. And what versioning does is essentially creates a copy of this, of the, of version one, brings about all the changes. And then from here on, you can add stuff uh, and new items to this specific version without affecting uh, the previous versions that you've created. So let me actually just go about doing that. Now I'm working on version 2.0 of this API. Um, so let me go in and add some information, additional information. So I'm gonna call this the Swagger Pet Store. I'm gonna give this some description so that people understand exactly what this API does, right? So I'm gonna say the API allows users to perform simple transactions of pets in the company's e-commerce platform. Like just some information. When people read it, they know what this tool does, with what this API does. Uh, version 2.0, so uh, I'm gonna put that in. And the cool thing about this is uh, with uh, Open API 3.0 is you can actually add multiple servers, right? So sometimes you might have your definition in localhost, which is like a development server, and you might also have a production server. So you can actually specify that, which is development, right? And you can do the same exact thing over here, and we can define our uh, production server. So I can just do this prod dot you know xyz dot com and uh, and this one is production <laughs> so this is just an easy way for you to actually like define multiple servers depending on you know the environment you're in and uh, notice that as I'm typing, Swagger Hub will automatically render that for you in real time, right on the Swagger uh, visualization panel on the right. So now let's go in and start, you know, defining this API better using Open API 3.0. So the first one which we're seeing over here is, you know, Inspector has actually generated the pet find by status uh, resource and which has a get method under this. So let's do some de detective work and understand exactly what this API is supposed to do. So this method, the get method is supposed to essentially give you the, the pet depending on its status. So the status could be available. It could also be after consulting with my development team, I realized that the other statuses could be pending or sold, right? So you have different statuses for your pets, um, which is what the implementation set tells you. Uh, and then from your responses, if you go in and look, you see that all of the responses have an ID uh, of the pet, the name of the pet, uh, some photo URLs, uh, the tags of the pet, and also returns the status of the pet. So now let's actually, using this information that we have after doing some inspection on this def definition generated, as well as talking to our development team, let's actually start defining this API now. So I'm gonna first, up, this says status, which is correct, right? I'm gonna add a definition description over here, which is allows users to find pets by state of availability 
right? And uh, the schema is over here, which is, and I, I define that it's a, sta it's a query parameter. Um, and then from here, let me define the schema. So open API 3.0 schema object is essentially telling you what goes on under this request or, or under this response as well. So in my case, I want it to be essentially uh, the schema. I want to say that, you know, this, this specific request accepts uh, the status of the pet, right? So, and we have three statuses available, pending and sold. So let's make that as an enum right over there. So the type over here is a string, which is correct. And from here, I'm going to put an enum and available pending and sold right and i'm going to set the default value for this to be available I just hit save and now you can notice that as I type it actually renders all of this again in real time so I just defined this basic endpoint over here this basic request under this endpoint so now let's go in and start defining our responses so again so uh, inspectors generated the foundation and the temp the foundational template of the open API 3.0 from an existing API implementation with really no learning curve involved just like okay, went and looked at the traffic and just generated the specification now let's lo look at the responses and I mentioned right like it gives you an entire a big response packet now let's use the power of open api 3.0 to define this requ the request the response packet so i know this is a successful response so it's a 200 response let me go in and uh, describe this uh, the specific endpoint now which is this response which is it gives me details of the pets by their status Right, and now this is where the cool content negotiation part of the open API comes into play. I can actually uh, define what type of content I require, and you can actually have multiple types of content in your open API response packet. So over here, for example, it defaults to application JSON because the, the data returned was JSON in inspector. And you can actually specify another pack, uh, uh, media type called XML and so on and so forth. So you can actually have uh, multiple uh, media types using the content negotiation aspect of open API 3.0. So let's start with defining the JSON uh, endpoint, uh, um, JSON re uh, response packet. And so from here, I'm gonna, I noticed my uh, response packet and I realized it's an array, right? So let's actually define that as an array. So schema, the type of this is an array. Um, and items, so if, if you have an array, then it's not an object, it's actually you have items under this array, which are all, which all are objects, so, so you have items. And now let's define the properties of these different uh, items. So properties is, a, is an object which actually allows you to uh, define exactly what are the, you know, like properties, like what, what is the information that you're actually returning, right? And what is the data type, examples, format, those kinds of things are all defined under properties. So now let's go in and define our first uh, response object or item, which is the ID, right? I see that one is one of the values returned, so ID. So let's go in under properties. I'm gonna define ID. I'm gonna put type as integer and say, let's say the format of this is int64. So it's an int64 uh, integer. So now let's look at the second response, which is a category, right? So now look at this category is actually its own uh, specific object, which has multiple items under it. So um, it has the ID as well as the name of uh, that pet, which is returned. So let's go in and add uh, that specific uh, response object. So. Uh, category the type is it's an object itself and from here 
I am going to define the properties that are under the specific category object, right? So ID is going to be what's returned, which will give me, which is an integer again, and name of the pet, and that is a string, and example value, let's say it's a cat. So this is again, I just defined the properties, uh, the, the properties of the category response object that is being returned over here. Now let's look at the other uh, um, response object which is returned, which is the name, right? So this is actually the name as well, which is returned, which is the name of the, the pet. So I'm gonna return name. Uh, this is again, the type is a string. An example of the name is Felix, right? So Felix the cat. Um, so I have just given uh, uh, the, one second, what, what just happened? Oh, sorry, I just, uh, looks like. So that's the thing about YAML is you need to be really careful about the indentations and make sure that it's all, you know, aligned. So yeah, so that's why these these helpful lines hopefully can help you in that aspect. Um, now let's look at uh, the photo URL. So photo URL essentially gives you like photos, right, of the, that specific pet. So let's go in and define the photo URL. So the photo URL, if you notice, is actually an array. It's actually, and you can see that by the symbol over here, it's an actually it's actually an array. So it's actually square brackets. So let's go in and now define uh, our array of. Uh, photo URLs, so, right, and from here, the type over here is an array, and if you recall, if you have a type as an array, then there are items under this array, so we call those as items, and then we define what exactly they are, these items, right, and you can actually give an example as well, which is, you know, photo1.xyz.com. So this is just an example of uh, the array. So this will hopefully give you an array of information like uh, uh, the photo URLs. And finally, the same exact logic for your tags uh, response as well. And so we go in, let's go in and define the tags. Type, uh, array, uh, items under this. Type is object, because you have multiple and then let's do some properties, right? ID would be type integer, and name would be type string, right? So we're just giving example, and we can give examples as well, right? So this example could be, um, you know, for, uh, for, right? That could be a type, or there could be a tag that the cat has been defined in. So this is just, again, the, um, really simple uh, and finally of course we have the status as well of the pet which is again defined over here so let's actually put that in as well and there you go so this really is the first uh, big endpoint that we actually uh, just remove that and this really is, uh, we just actually defined that entire request and response packet using OpenAPI 3.0 with the, in, with the inspector generated definition as the foundation of this uh, template, right? So you've actually come all the way to like a really good well-designed uh, API uh, straight from that existing API implementation using inspector and then come into Swagger Hub and worked as a team to get this done. Right, so now you can actually click save. Uh, of course, there's one aspect which uh, you can also like always like add a new version to this API, which is 3.0. Again, and we can actually make this API look better with the ability to actually compartmentalize uh, some of the reusable components using the components feature, right? So over here, uh, for example, you can actually reference uh, these responses under the components object. So components essentially in OpenAPI 3.0 allows you to store reusable objects that can be referenced by different requests and responses. So this is just an example of how you can use the, uh, the components uh, aspect of the OpenAPI 3.0 file.
right? So there you have it, folks. This is uh, just of course uh, a, a brief overview of uh, how you can actually convert uh, your existing APIs, either your existing API definitions to Open API 3.0, or your existing API implementations, and create that Open API definition template using tools like Swagger Inspector or Swagger Core. Migrate that to Swagger Hub and like work on uh, the actual definition process as a team using uh, Swagger Hub. And then of course, like Swagger Hub has some cool features which you can add and you know generate like for example uh, JSON files and YAML files of that existing API definition as well. Uh, push it into your local machine, and um, work together as a team to get this API out there. So let me uh, uh, one second. Let me reshare my screen. So yeah, so I uh, hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. These are just some of the resources you can uh, tap into. Like we have some great documentation about our open source tools on swagger.io slash docs, as well as uh, some amazing documentation about open API 3.0 and how to use it. Um, our open source projects are available on GitHub under the Swagger API name. Uh, we have a well-updated blog. We try to update the blog at least once a week. And you can check out some of our free and uh, paid tools like uh, Inspector, which is uh, on inspector.swagger.io, uh, and Swagger Hub. And Swagger Hub, again, is uh, it's both paid as well as free. So if you are an individual and you don't want to collaborate, you can always use Swagger Hub for free as an individual uh, with an API limit of, I believe, free. And if you want to work together as a team, you can always use Swagger Hub as a team as well. And there are cheers for that. So with that said, I want to hand it off to Nicole. And uh, Stephen, if you have any questions that we should answer online, let us know. Yeah, uh, quickly before we jump into Q&A, just wanted to uh, post a quick poll. Um, so if you guys want to answer that to get any more information about the tools that we talked about today, that'd be awesome. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, is Swagger Hub available on-prem or just in the cloud? Uh, yeah, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. It, Swagger Hub is available both as an on-premise installation or as a cloud-based application. And with the Swagger Maven plugin that I showed, it also has support for that automated workflow with our on-premise Swagger Hub uh, installation. All right, another question is, um, does CodeGen support OAS 3.0 yet? Yeah, good question. Uh, it, it's, we have a few languages released and I have to double check with the team on that and that's, it's, it is available on GitHub. For the entire breadth of uh, languages, uh, we are actively working on it as a community and as a team. And our hope is to get it out by at least in the next one month or so. So uh, please stay tuned. And again, it's an open source project. So if you want to contribute, please do, uh, you know, in terms of bugs, if you in fixes or even in terms of like raising tickets and feature suggestions, please do let us know. Uh, okay. Does Swagger support OAS 3.0.NET Core? Uh, yes, it does. We actually, I believe Swashbuckle is the one for, uh, you know, generating open API files or Swagger spec, spec files from uh, existing .NET uh, infrastructure implementations. And uh, that is not maintained by the SmartBird open source Swagger team. Uh, it is done by someone else, uh, but it is a very active community in itself. So you should definitely check out, uh, I think it's Swashbuckle, which is, which does it, .NET. Uh, Fairly certain, but again, like, please double check on that uh, on that front. All right. Uh, how about Kevin asked? Uh, he's trying to implement callbacks and links and failing to do so. Can you point him in the direction of good example of implementation for that? Uh, for of an implementation for also? callback and links. Uh, I don't. I don't have it on the top of my head, of course. Uh, but you know, we should we should definitely follow up with you. Uh, yeah. And we'll definitely find something. And if you haven't, you should also check out our documentation on swagger.io. We were just talking about this, but it has some great examples and it breaks it down piece by piece. It's not a full implementation, but that might guide you in the right direction if you haven't been able to, to look at that yet. Yeah, there's another question, which is, do you have documentation on how to design a REST API? We actually have a blog post on Swagger.io, which is best practices on how to design an API. And we also have, if you, if you want to get a step-by-step -step understanding of defining an API using OpenAPI 3.0, there's definitely like a great YouTube tutorial, which we've done a couple months ago. So if you just go YouTube, uh, if you go to YouTube and search for how to design Open API and OpenAPI 3.0, uh, there's a video which we've created uh, about a couple of months ago. It's been well-received. So please do check that out as well. 
Okay, one more question. Does OAS 3.0 support multiple schema for the responses? Uh, yes, it does. Yes, oh, oh, it does. Uh, again, it's uh, we have the ability to create multiple uh, response uh, types, media types. Uh, so definitely, again, you can do that. So and also, like you know, depending on the st uh, the response type. So if it's a successful response, if you're defined with the 200, you know, we had that example. If you have a 400, 500, 401, 507, you know, whatever, like you can always use Open API for defining all of them. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, just a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be sent to you automatically when it's ready for download. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, don't forget to reach out and ask. Uh, and you can always find us online. All right, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.